So uh, my talk today is about outrageous acts of thinking. Last year, uh, I was invited to a conference in France. And after the conference ended, I, we spent a couple of days in Paris. And we went to a dinner. In my mind, this is where I wanted to go to dinner. <laughs> but really, we ended up in a much more low-key establishment. And there were some people from the conference. And I was introduced. And somebody said, she's a physicist. And immediately, this woman, this young woman, gets up with excitement and says, oh, wow, I love physicists. And I said, oh, wow, this is great. Are you a physicist? And she's like, no, 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 I'm an artist. But you don't understand. I mean, I, I work with physics. In fact, a piece I'm working on right now in the Amazon, I'm creating this art piece, and it has everything to do with physics. And I go, really? It's a quantum mechanical piece. I was blown away. I said, wow, tell me how. I, I'm not, not sure I understand. She said, well, the community that I'm working with in the Amazon is very unique. They're very quantum mechanical. <laughs> in what sense, I asked. And she said, you know, they're very spiritual. They're non-materialistic. And just like quantum mechanics says, there's a lot more space in spirituality than there is matter. I looked at everyone at the table, and in the words of famous physicist Wolfgang Pauli, I said to myself, that's not even wrong. <laughs> and you would think that after 10 years of being a science communicator and a skeptic, I would be better equipped to deal with a situation like that, and I would keep my cool and just maybe laugh about it, but I couldn't. I got into a fight with her. <laughs> I, uh, I ruined the dinner for everyone. There was a reputable venture capitalist in the corner, and I overheard, and that hurt me a lot. I overheard him say, well, you're, to her, he said, you're free to use the term in whichever way you want to. I mean, that's what you want to say, and you want to think about that. Scientists are so close-minded. And it really irritated me. And I couldn't sleep that night, and possibly partly was because I didn't deal with the situation in a good way, but also because I, I really I knew there was something there, because I've been in that moment for so many times. And I thought, yes, people are we're constantly um, attacked by tons of information, some wild, crazy ideas that don't seem reasonable. but you know, sometimes they turn out to be true. And sometimes we, things that we hold dear to our common sense turn out to be false. So this lady heard the term quantum mechanics, and she saw fit to interpret it in her own way. And so I said, I need to find a way to promote the fact that science doesn't work like that. Science is evidence-based. And sometimes that evidence contradicts our common sense. And that's a pretty painful thing to accept. So I came up with four categories in two axes. One, true and false, that has to do with evidence, whether there's evidence for something or there isn't. And another one, reasonable and outrageous, that has to do with our common sense, our intuition. Let me be a little more specific about how I define these terms. True and false have to do with evidence. So something true is something that is supported by evidence, and something false is something that is contradicted by evidence. Now, you may have already some epistemological complaints about that definition. And yes, I agree that there are no absolute truths. Even in science, things are not immutable. Things change with time. And science is an ever-increasingly better approximation of reality. But I think we can all agree that it's better to have incomplete truths that are approximations than completely random opinions that are not even wrong. And the second axis talks about outrageous and reasonable. And that has nothing to do with evidence. That's purely based on a social construction. What we think is reasonable has to do with our historical context, what our friends think, how we were brought up, et cetera. And we all hold things uh, dear to our common sense. And sometimes what is outrageous can end up, again, being true 
or it most often ends up being false. But this is the way uh, I define uh, the categories. And let, you can get four possible combinations from these two axes. On the top left, you can get something that's reasonable and that happens very frequently, ends up being true. Your intuition, your common sense agrees with it. It fits with the, the preconceived notions that you have of reality. And it also happens to be supported by evidence. So that would fall there. On the top right quadrant, something that is reasonable and we, we, we happen to feel or intuit that is true, turns out to be contradicted by evidence. And we as skeptic must be able to, as skeptics must be able to change our minds about it. Now, on the outrageous axis, we see that something um, that seems wild and crazy, an idea that doesn't fit at all with our preconceived notions of reality, can end up, uh, you know, most of the times it will end up being false in the lower right quadrant. But sometimes those outrageous ideas in the history of science have ended up being true. So, Let's dig in to see some examples. If I tell you today that there's enough evidence to support that washing your hands after shaking hands with people and before you eat prevents disease, you're probably going to think that I'm saying something reasonable. We all admit it. We all accept it as a culture, as a community. And it's supported by evidence. There's enough evidence out there that germs get spread when we don't wash our hands. However, sadly, this is a tragic story in the history of science. That was not the case when this idea first came about. Ignaz Semmelweis was a doctor in the 1800s, and he, he was an obstetrician in Vienna. And he noticed that the obstetricians that were uh, helping women give birth were also prior to that, working with cadavers. And he noticed that there was a correlation. A lot of women were dying in childbirth, by the way. And he noticed that washing the hands with an antiseptic that he proposed reduced the incidence of childbed fever from which women died from, depending on what clinic in Vienna you were talking about, from 10 to 35 percent, depending on the clinic, all the way to 1 percent. The data showed there was evidence for it. Sadly, that observation conflicted with the reality of the, uh, at the time. Remember, we didn't yet have the theory of germs that Pasteur ca came up with years later. So he encountered the establishment that thought he was completely insane. How could a cadaver, a dead body, transmit a disease? There was no mechanism. There was no understanding of how that could possibly be true. So poor Semmelweis ended up uh, in a mental asylum where he was put because people thought he was insane. And he died alone and never knowing that his theory was true. Let me give you an, exam an example of something that is reasonable. Oh, and by the way, I'm talking, everything that, I, that I'm saying right now is from today's perspective. So these categories are see, as we see them today. So today, we know that the geocentric model of the universe, that is the Earth at the center, not only of our solar system, but of the universe, is, um, is wrong, is false. However, it kind of seems reasonable, and I'll tell you why. So Ptolemy re was um, sort of not only a proponent, but was the main refiner of the Ptolemaic model, which put the Earth at the center. And um, basically, at the time, it seemed to be a very reasonable idea. And I would say even today. Why? Because if you think about it, when you wake up in the morning, you look at the sky, and you don't see the Earth moving. What do you see move? You see the, the moon go from one side to the other at night, and you see the sun rise on the horizon and setting on the other uh, side. So of course, it's kind of intuitive to think, and it's reasonable, that the Earth is not moving and that everything else is moving around it. Not only that, but it's also true that the Earth, I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I'm moving. And the Earth is, feels quite solid and stable. 
And so it, it was reasonable. It made intuitive sense. Not only that, but let me tell you the interesting part about this. It's not that it was reasonable, because many things can be reasonable, but then they turn out to be wrong, but that it was true. The Ptolemaic was true not for five or 10 years, not for 100 years. The geocentric model was true in the scientific sense of the word for 1,500 years. It was a very sophisticated model. I know children are taught to mock these silly people nowadays, but they were brilliant. If you think about it, so the Earth was not quite at the center, but it was kind of at the center. Each planet around it went around a circular orbit called the deferent, perhaps in deference to the Earth. Not only that, but each planet along that orbit had its own little circular uh, orbit called an epicycle. So it was orbiting like in circles and also around the Earth. It was a very sophisticated model, but it predicted every astronomical observation with great accuracy. There was evidence to support this model. So it was true in a scientific sense, and it lasted for a very long time. It wasn't until many, many years later that Copernicus suggested a conceptual advancement which was to put the sun at the center, a heliocentric model. But it was a limited theory because he still kept the orbits as, as circular and not as ellipses that we know uh, they are. And so unfortunately, you know, it didn't even, it, yes, it was more advanced because the sun was at the center, but it didn't offer any more accuracy than the Ptolemaic model. Later, Kepler, refined it a little bit, bit more by saying the orbits are actually ellipses. And you know, that gave, he came up with his uh, laws of planetary mo motion, but it really wasn't until Galileo Galilei observed through his telescope that Venus, the planet, had phases, has phases, like the moon. And that was in 1610, many, many years after the Ptolemaic model and they, the, the geocentric model uh, was in place. And that was the first time that an astronomical observation did not correspond and did not agree with the predictions of a geocentric model. So 1,500 years later, it was dethroned, but it took a very long time. So scientific truths also change, and that makes our jobs as skeptics really hard. An example of something outrageous but that turns out to be true, is general relativity. It's actually our current theory of how, relativi how uh, gravitation works. But it's a young theory. It's only about 100 years old. In fact, we just celebrate its birthday in, in 2015. And so um, at the time when it came about, it was so outrageous that many scientists concluded that there was no evidence enough evidence for this, and it contradicted Newton's very well-established ideas. And it wasn't until Sir Arthur Eddington led some expeditions to Brazil and other islands, and then uh, did an experimental observation of a solar eclipse that was predicted by the general theory of relativity. It wasn't until 1919 when Einstein's paper came in 1915 and that it was confirmed. And that's how Einstein became a celebrity and the, the Einstein we all have learned to love. So what is general relativity and why is it so outrageous? So basically, if we think in Newtonian classical mechanics, when two huge masses collide or, or pass by one another, they get attracted. And we have Newton's law of gravitational motion. But that has nothing to do with space or with time. That attraction happens in an instant, so time doesn't even factor in. And space is simply the container where it happens. Space just stays there. But that's not what general relativity says. What we now know to be true is that, like um, Wheeler, who was a, famous is a, was a famous astronomer and physicist, said this very famous quote, Space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. And 
I like to think of space, just one variable at a time. So what this quote means, and I'll start with the second part, is that a huge mass, such as the sun, curves by virtue of a gravitational force, curves this very space, the fabric of space around it. And because that space gets warped and gets curved, then another matter, meaning another planet or another big mass, but a smaller mass coming with an initial velocity, gets informed by the structure of that space. And it doesn't just move in a straight line like we see in everyday life. It actually follows a different trajectory. Because it has a velocity, it starts orbiting around the sun. And so you see space, matter, the big sun tells space how to curve. And then space tells matter, the planet, how to move around the sun. And this is what we now know. Not only that, but the consequences um, of the theory of, of general relativity are that not only big masses curve in, in uh, space, but also in, in space uh, curves um, the trajectory of, of, of masses, but also curves the trajectory of light. And this is incredible. When light is coming and passes by the sun, which is a huge mass, that gravitational force bends the light, and it gets deflected. And we end up capturing it somewhere else, even though it came from a different direction. But this is outrageous. This does not fit our intuition by any means. We never in our everyday life see light bending around objects. We see it traveling in straight paths. And so all these ideas are really outrageous. Yet, not only have we confirmed it to an incredible degree, so we have enough evidence to know that it's true, but also the fact that clocks on Earth, this is a prediction by the theory, clocks on Earth run slightly slower than clocks on satellites. And if we didn't account for that correction, we, none of us could ever use our Google Maps because our GPS systems would not work. So it, in practice, also it's been proven not only by evidence, but also in practical terms. We use it in everyday life. And our latest confirmation happened in February in 2015, when two huge black holes merged as, this, as they collided with one another many, many years ago. And the prediction was that as they collided, some of the energy in the collision would be lost and would be converted into energy of waves that would travel along space and time. And that one day, those ripples, those waves would arrive at the Earth. And two very large interferometers in the LIGO, advanced LIGO experiment, were able to measure that at the expected time, those little tiny ripples that arrived on Earth. So we have even a more recent confirmation that general uh, relativity is true for now. Now, an example that makes, should make all of us angry of something false and outrageous is that the, the correlation that was um, told to people that vaccines cause autism, a very, very dangerous idea that this bad man came up with. <laughs> so it's super recent. Andrew Wakefield, he's still alive, almost was able to show his movie at the Tribeca Film Festival. And he came up with the idea or maybe the lawyers that were trying to sue the companies came up with the idea that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, all those three combined, caused autism. The crazy thing is that the vaccine had been out since 1971. And he said this in 1998, many years after thousands of children had been vaccinated. And there were some dramatic it drops in the incident, incidence of the diseases. So it was an outrageous claim with no evidence. He did fraudulent work. And sadly, the paper was mildly retracted in 2004 and you know, completely retracted in 2010. But by that time, the damage to our culture and our society had been done. So this is the, the paper in 1998. That's his seminal paper. But what drives me nuts is that thousands of children were vaccinated. 
but he did a study with 12 children. It's not even statistically significant. And yet, we just had an outbreak last year in Disneyland because people still find that connection and that idea reasonable. So it's really, really hard to change this idea. So as you can see, we have uh, things that are reasonable that um, turn out to be true, and other things that we hold dear to our common sense turn out, turn out they're false. I think the hardest job as skeptics is to work in the upper right and the lower left quadrants. It's easy to deal with things that are outrageous, crazy, and also false. We dismiss them every day. It's easy when something fits our intuition or our common sense, and it's also true, but it's very hard to work with things that we find very reasonable, but evidence contradicts them. And to have the integrity and the critical thinking to be able to change our minds, that is a painful process. And also, ideas that are outrageous and we dismiss them initially to later be proven wrong and to battle in the public arena, uh, you know, seeing that people have outrageous ideas and some of them may end up having evidence to prove them. So that's a very uh, tough task. Now, it gets complicated even further by the fact that these categories are not constant in time. As I showed in historical examples, they change. So I showed you examples from the perspective of today, but let me tell you that now in the past, the geocentric model of the universe now we know it's false, but at the time it was reasonable and also true. Washing hands was outrageous, even though it was true, there was evidence for it. General relativity was considered false when it initially came out, and it was outrageous, and it still is. And vaccines was uh, reasonable for some people when it came out, and turns out to be false. But with time, things changed. And that complicates our jobs a lot. Because skepticism, and I leave you with these parting thoughts, is about deep thinking. It's not about quick answers. It's not about following our intuition right away, although sometimes intuition helps. But it's about deep, critical thinking about issues, about researching, about trying to find who did the research, why, what are the mo motivations and, and, and the quality of the studies that we read in order to conclude things about the world that surrounds us. Also, we should strive for evidence-based in every arena in our lives because that is the true essence of being a skeptic. And as I see sometimes in the skeptic community, people sometimes think, think that rejecting everything is being a skeptic. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes having an open mind that is open to new ideas is required to accept new evidence. And so I like to say that one must keep a very open mind, but always corralled by evidence. It's not the path of least resistance. I can guarantee you that. But it is certainly a path worth taking. Thank you very much.